All right, everybody, hello. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for uh, sitting tight while we figured out some technical difficulties. What is a tech conference without IT problems, am I right? Um, my name is Akira Brand. I am joined today by my co-presenter, Jennifer Chapleski, and we are thrilled to be talking to you today about how to reduce what we call toil in your application security programs. So like I said, my name is Akira Brand. I am an AppSec engineer and consultant. In addition to my engineering work, I work with startups to mature and create AppSec programs from the ground up. In my free time, I also like to contribute to open source. So I work with small nascent projects of open source software that are interested in including AppSec practices from the get-go in their SDLC. Jennifer, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jennifer Chapleski, um, and I work for Target Corporation. I lead two functions there. One of them is the application security function, so things like scanners for applications and pen testing and vulnerability management, as well as endpoint security, which is for the hundreds of thousands of endpoints that Target has, we make sure those are protected. So today we're going to talk about toil. We're going to do a little bit of definition around what toil is. We're gonna tell you what it isn't. We're gonna tell you hopefully why you should care about it. But what we're really wanting to do is inspire all of you to go back to your organizations and start tackling all the toil that you probably have. So when Akira and I started brainstorming for this talk, she represents startups, I represent larger enterprises, and we thought we're gonna do a compare and contrast talk about toil that shows up in large enterprise versus startups. First lesson we learned, it's all the same toil. It's just at different scales and it shows up differently. So when we share a lot of these examples, almost universally we're seeing different versions of these in startup organizations as well as large enterprise. The other thing that's really interesting about what we want to show you today is nothing in here is going to be the most technical talk that you go to. What we're talking about is actually quite simple but it requires a whole lot of intentionality from you and your teams to actually go after it. And so those are the, the things we want you to take away from the talk today. So first, let's talk about what toil is. Hard work, especially work that makes you physically tired. This is the non-tech definition. So we're in the city of San Francisco, probably the farthest from the Corn Belt you can be. Um, has anyone here spent three days like I did, walking through fields, pulling the tops of tassels off of corn stalks, corn detasseling. It's the worst job you'll ever have. It is the definition of toil. You are toiling in the fields and it's the worst. So that's not what we're talking about, although as the daughter of a farmer, my dad would love that I talked about this today. What we are talking about is tech toil, tedious, repetitive, probably boring work that just comes as the cost of running a production system. This is something that Google talks a lot about. They're the ones who coined the phrase toil as it relates to um, technology. And so we'll be referencing some of their work today as we better define it for you. So let's use a common example that maybe isn't corn detasseling. <laughs> I saw a few people in here, but let's use an example that all of us have certainly done at one point or another, and that is washing the dishes by hand. So we're gonna define toil in its six parts, and each section is going to have a little bit of uh, an example via washing the dishes. However, as I go through these slides, I want y'all to start to think about for yourselves what in my organization fits this category and you're gonna start to have, it's gonna be like popcorn kernels, bam, 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 bam. You're gonna start to identify that toil. So, the first thing about toil is it is manual. Okay, of course, when you're washing the dishes by hand, you are doing it manually. However, anything that is tied to running a production system in the world of technology that you have to kick off by hand, it might be toil. Second thing, it is tactical. It is interrupt driven, like a pager alert. In the world of doing dishes, if your household is anything like mine, when someone starts to wash them, everybody just rushes in and says, oh, here's a plate, here's a cup, here's a spoon. So it is interrupt driven. The third thing, it scales linearly, which means that as the amount of work goes up, the amount of effort you have to put in to finish that work also goes up. So again, of course, with dishes, there's just more and more, and you have to do more and more work to get it done. 
It is repetitive. This is a task that you do not once in a while, not once or twice a year, but it is over and over again. It might be a couple times a week. It might be every day. It happens uh, as many times as a simple chore would. The fifth section here, it is automatable. Now, with the invention of the dishwasher, all of our problems went away, of course. Well, maybe just a couple, just washing the dishes. But anything that is automatable, it might actually be toiled. So you're going to want to take a look and see, does it also fit into any of these other categories? The last section that we have is a definition of toil is that there is no enduring value brought to that production system after you are done doing the work required to maintain it. So I'm going to give you all a second just to take a picture of this slide if you want. But show of hands, who here is starting to identify toil in their life or in their organization, right? Ooh. Almost everybody's hand is going up. All right, let's continue. I'm so excited to see all of your hands going up. That's how we felt when we were building these slides too. Like, oh yeah, that's true. Oh yeah, that's true. And we haven't even gotten to the examples. So here's what toil isn't. It has nothing to do with whether you like doing it or not. It's like, what, day 100 of RSA, so we're gonna keep doing audience participation. Do you like doing the dishes? Some people do. It's, okay, nobody likes doing the dishes. Like, some <laughs> people think that it's really soothing and calm. Most people, me, don't like doing the dishes, but it doesn't matter if you like something or you don't like it, it has no bearing on whether or not it's toil. Some engineers like work that they're familiar and feel confident in. Some engineers like to do really innovative things. The concepts are just not the same. And why we bring these things up is as we start talking to people about whether or not you have toil, they gravitate toward anything I don't like is toil. And that's the definition that we want to make sure everybody doesn't walk away with. I don't love slogging through email, but it's not toil. A human, me, has to decide what I'm going to do, how am I going to respond, am I going to respond. So it can't be toil. Um, refactoring code is not toil. It's something that can be repetitive. However, when you're done, you should have a much better functioning system. So it's not toil. The other thing that toil isn't is overhead. I work with a lot of pen testers, and when I said, hey, what do you see as toil in pen testing? They're like, oh, the meetings, and when we start the pen test, there's so many meetings and all the data we have to gather. That's not toil. Those are team meetings. Those are humans for hopefully good strategic reasons, having sessions. And it's also not managerial tasks. Writing your review is not toil. Reading reviews is not toil. So those things are just part of the definition of what toil is not. So a lot of hands already went up. Good. We've already started convincing you that you want to tackle your toil. But if you were still thinking about it, let will give you some reasons why this is super important. Toil affects your team, and toil affects your business. And don't take our word for it. Um, I mentioned in my intro that I have a background in organizational commitment, and this is where the science of that comes through. So first of all, let's talk about burnout. And in the year 2000, the Journal of Clinical Psychology came out with a study about burnout. And they said that the reason that people experience burnout primarily is that they are spending time on low-value tasks. Burnout occurs when people who have the psychological need to feel like their life is meaningful and significant spend time doing things in the toil definition that are not meaningful and are not value-driven. They experience higher degrees of burnout. But it gets worse. That burnout actually doesn't affect all performers the same. 2021 in Applied Psychology, a different psychological journal, said that um, employees experience burnout at a higher rate when they are high performing or historically high performing employees. So you're going to create burnout, turnover, career stagnation in a worse way for employees who have historically been high performing than employees who are medium or low performers. So there's definitely an impact for toil on your teams. But think about the impact to the business. These things that you're working on, the low value tasks that are repeatable and could be automated, you're making value trade-offs with your own organization and the values or the, the objectives that you want to achieve. You're going to see a lower return on investment. I work for a for-profit company. We care about return on investment. But startups care about return on investment. Nonprofits care about return on investment. And so no matter what kind of organization you're in, you should really care about the return on investment. You should really care about the velocity of the, your teams. Google does a lot of work in this space. They're the ones who coined the term toil. And they have um, a lot of SRE engineers who tackle the toil. They um, estimate that their SRE engineers spend between 33 and 50%, the goal is 33, 
tackling all the toil. Most organizations don't have a dedicated SRE function, so all of that toil is spread throughout your development organization. So just imagine, if you will, a world where your developers could spend that much more time not toiling and spending it on the objectives that your business exists for. Beautiful. Okay, so we have told you so far a lot about toil, what it is, and why you should care. So now you need to probably discover, well, this is great, but what do I do about it? Jennifer and I, through our mutual experiences, have created a process that we would like to introduce to you now to show you how to tackle your toil. So the first section of this process is to identify your toil. As with all complicated problems, you want to understand the problem in depth before you can start to look for a solution. We will talk just here in a moment about how to identify toil, but we know that this is the most important part of the process and where you should be spending the bulk of your time. The second is to evaluate. Toil is insidious and it hides in plain sight, but not all toil is actually worth tackling and putting time and resources toward. So you're gonna wanna evaluate how much is this toil costing my company? How much is this toil costing my employees? Are people upset? Are they disgruntled? Are we throwing away money somewhere? And you wanna start to discover for yourself where should we spend our time? The third section, of course, is to decide. You can do one of two things when tackling toil. You can either choose to just stop doing the thing that classifies itself as toil, or if you cannot stop doing that thing, then you must decide what to do about it. Now, in our stories later, you're gonna discover that the way that we decided what to do was different depending on our organization. So this is why, of course, we recommend spending the bulk of your time on identifying the toil because that is something that is universal and you can share with your peers and colleagues, whereas deciding what to do about it will of course be different depending on your organization. The last thing to do, of course, is to implement and measure. You're gonna wanna implement the, uh, the process of reducing the toil, and the last thing you wanna do is you wanna measure what you've done. So in the evaluate stage, you're gonna create a hypothesis of here's what I think will fix my toil, and here's the measurements that I'm going to take to make sure that I'm actually making progress here. If you have proven your hypothesis correct, feel free, of course, to uh, iterate on top of that, and if you haven't proven your hypothesis correct, go back to this process. Did you evaluate it properly? Did you decide what to do properly? Did you even identify it properly? And then you can uh, reframe your hypothesis or, of course, look at your process. All right. Let's talk about how to identify toil. Who here thinks that maybe they have a hunch of like, okay, I think I could use these six definitions or like has kind of a hunch that they're starting to kind of pop, feeling some, feeling some toil in their life? Yes? Okay, beautiful. So identifying the toil, Jennifer and I um, actually came up with this really impressive algorithm and we all hope that you think that we are really smart just kidding, there is no algorithm that you can use to identify toil, unfortunately. What you can do, however, is look at those six points of toil that we talked about earlier today, and you can also ask yourself and your team, what work is interrupt-driven? What work should not be done? What work could be assigned to a more appropriate team because one person's toil is another person's treasure? And is one person or one team being overburdened by this work? So let's break the second process down. How do you start evaluating the toil? First, you've got your list. You've got your list of toil and um, thought through where are we finding all of this toil. A good place to look is anywhere where the answer for why we do something is because that's how we've always done it. There's probably a lot of toil there. And then it just becomes almost a mathematic cost exercise. How many hours do we spend on this process on a weekly basis, on a quarterly basis, on an annual basis, add up the hours, and then up, uh, multiply it by a dollar amount. We went with $75 an hour as a blended rate. I've talked to a few of you during this week who think that might be a little bit low, but start thinking about what are those hours actually costing, and then form a hypothesis for how you wanna tackle this particular toil. It's really important um, to think about whose toil we're referring to. So Akira and I both come from an application security background. We're on the security team, that's why we're here at RSA. 
And so the application security team will see Toil like responding to frequent developer questions. We get tons of questions, we wanna be good partners, we answer them, interrupt driven all the time. But because it's interrupt driven and it's rep repetitive, it's Toil for the application security team. They can see Toil like imperfect alerting. You're doing something, you get an alert that a system might be having a problem, you go check it out, it's a false positive. That's Toil. Be very, very careful if you're here representing a security team to not identify all of your Toil and then transfer that Toil to your development organization. At Target, we have over 4,000 developers. So even a little bit of Toil that sits with the AppSec team that moves to the developers, exponentially more expensive. Things like responding to misassigned security issues, that's no problem for the AppSec team. Great, I sent it to the wrong team. Okay, send it back. I'll tell you in a minute you know, who the next group is gonna get it is. But that's really toily for the teams to have to tackle. And so if you're just starting to think about this, be very, very careful about not eliminating or reducing toil, but transferring toil because it becomes very expensive. Let's do an example. So I already talked about this one. Akira and I both have agreed this is like our top toil for the AppSec team. Responding to the same developer questions over and over again. On a good week, we could spend 12 hours doing this or 624 hours a year that's almost $50,000 that we spend answering the same question. Y'all are doing this too. And so the hypothesis is, if we had better documentation, could we reduce it? Could we make it five hours a week? But if we're talking about developer-facing issues, they have to respond to those misassigned security issues. It doesn't happen that much, 2,000 times a year. But even if it's 30 minutes per event, when you consider like, okay, I was doing this, I gotta go look at it, I gotta figure out what they're talking about. Oops, that's not us, send it back but $75,000. So could we improve this metric to fewer events per year? We do a better job triaging them, or could we reduce the time to dispose? What we're not saying is get rid of the toil in this case. Eliminating all the toil across your organization, we don't think it's possible. If you get there, please let us know. We wanna hear your success stories. But what we're really trying to do is figure out what the right minimization of the toil that you have is and what that would look like. So you've got your list, you've figured out the baseline cost, hopefully you're getting as excited as we did when we started thinking about the toil in our environment. Sometimes you just need to discard it. So we've had a couple pandemic years, I watched a lot of Netflix, maybe you all watched a lot of Netflix. Marie Kondo, Akira and I got to bond over our love for Marie Kondo and talking about this. But when Marie Kondo comes in and she's going to be tidying a space, she doesn't immediately say, whoa, you got a lot of stuff in here, let's organize it. When you watch HDTV, they get everything out of the room before they start. And so think about where you can discard those processes that really aren't necessary as part of your process. My team's so tired of me talking about Peter Drucker quotes, um, but this is one of my favorites. There's nothing quite so useless as doing with great efficiency something that should not be done at all. Uh, we actually have a story where this was successful for us. So when I joined the application security function at Target eight years ago, we had a really cool dashboard that was all these metrics. We put them into a PowerPoint. We sent it out to a bunch of the security executive team. It looked great. We were thinking about how much time we spent, which is about a week a month, building this dashboard. And we started asking, oh, how do you, what do you think of the dashboard? Yeah, it's good. Great, what do you do with the data? And they're like, sometimes we read it, definitely. What do you do about anything in it? I can't think of anything that we've done from the data. And so we just stopped building the dashboard, gave our team back 40 hours on a month, which was a really great way to tackle the toil in this particular case. But that's not gonna happen for a lot of stuff. You are gonna have to fix what remains, and there's lots of ways you can do that. Here's a few ways that we have been successful. First, low-hanging fruit, quick wins. Everybody loves a quick win. You can probably tackle some things pretty quickly, get some wins, get the momentum going with your team. Biggest cost savings, fantastic. People like to save a lot of costs. Those end up being the things that have a longer tail. And so our recommendation is to balance the cost savings with uh, the low hanging fruit. You could think about payback period. How much are we spending on this? How much will it cost to fix? And you can apply sort of the payback period uh, methodology to figure out the best way to tackle that toil, or loudest developer pain points. Tons of people here are very passionate about developer relations, and tackling the developer pain points is a great way for application security teams to get some credibility with your development partners. Fabulous. All right, so let's talk about the last section, implement and measure. 
So this is not a time to set it and forget it. Just try to tackle some toil and not measure your results to know if you're actually saving your business money. Not only is this, of course, good for the bottom line and good for your developers and AppSec team's morale, it will also help you get sponsors to tackle this toil in the future, right? So if you can come to your senior leadership and say, hey, by the way, I just saved us $50,000 by doing this uh, simple exercise in tackling toil, they're gonna want you to continue to do that. And the best part about this is that tackling toil is fun. Another thing that you can do to see if you are actually being effective is to take a security metric at the beginning of this. We're gonna talk about how toil does not only affect your bottom line, and it affects your employees' well-being. It helps increase your organization's security posture. So take a metric, see if it has improved throughout the time that you've been tackling your toil. You will be surprised. You will actually find improvement in your security posture. Second thing is, of course, did your hypothesis become achieved? And if it didn't, look at your process. Are you evaluating this properly? Are you deciding what to do properly? Are you implementing properly? And if not, update your hypothesis. And if you have, Iterate and improve on top of um, what you're already doing and go forth and be awesome. <laughs> so let's talk about a story in startup world. How many people here have been the first application security hire at a startup or another organization? Very good. Okay, so our pain, your gain. <laughs> Get it. Um, how many people have been... Um, the sole application security engineer at an organization. Okay, yeah. So I'm sure that you are thinking to yourself, wow, Akira, this actually resonates with me very deeply because as the first and sole application security engineer at my last company, I had a lot of toil and I did not have a team to spread it around with. So I was miserable, right? Um, I had so much work on, on my plate. I didn't have a way to automate a lot of it. And like I said earlier, toil is insidious in that it hides in plain sight. So something that you're doing repeatedly over and over and over again that is automatable, that also fits into those other definitions of toil, you may not see as toil or it just kind of becomes part of the background noise of your job. So I decided to start to look for work that was manual, that was repetitive, that scaled linearly, and also did not have any enduring value. So the thing that I pinpointed was I was manually triaging and assigning our SaaS vulnerabilities because our SaaS tool did not integrate with our ticketing system. It was a mess. So let's do a quick thought experiment. Let's evaluate the cost of this toil. So again, the list of what we're doing, the identified toil, is that I'm manually triaging and assigning SaaS vulnerabilities to my developers. This took me about six hours a week, 312 hours a year if I don't take vacation. That is $24,000 a year, in addition to how much the SaaS tool costs. This turned out to be almost half a head worth of work spent on this one task, just because I didn't have an optimized tool, my developers didn't know how to use the tool, and uh, there was no way to integrate the tool into our ticketing system. So I'm really passionate about developer education. And the first place I look with toil is can I get my developers, since I'm the only AppSec person, to help me share this load? So my hypothesis was if I could train my developers on how to use the SaaS dashboard, get the SaaS tooling into their IDE, and get somehow the ticketing system more resolved, could I increase the amount of, uh, excuse me, decrease the amount of time I spent touching this process, and could I also have uh, fewer vulnerabilities overall? Spoiler alert, the answer is yes. So there was a couple things I decided to do. I decided to go for the low hanging fruit and the quick wins, and I also decided to tackle this point because it was not only the developer's pain points, they didn't understand what what they needed to do when the, when the vulnerabilities were triaged and assigned to them. I also had a very loud pain point and I knew I had to do something. So, after I implemented the developer training on the SaaS dashboard, I started to notice my time spent going down in a non-significant amount. The second thing I did was I integrated that IDE 
uh, the SAS plugin for the IDE, and I started to notice again, my time spent toiling, manually triaging these vulnerabilities went down, and not only that, this was good news, actually. The vulnerabilities I was starting to see were different. I wasn't doing the same thing over and over and over because the developers were able to integrate the, the SAS tool into their development process and make fewer vulnerabilities overall. Last thing I did is I finally got the system to tune with our ticketing system. That, of course, reduced the time by up to 50%. And, of course, reduced vulnerabilities as well because we had better vulnerability management. So all this is toil, and if I hadn't started to think of it in this way, I would have just been stuck doing the same thing over and over because, of course, that's how it has always been done. So, Jennifer, tell us a little bit about Target's detoiling journey. Thank you. So let's talk a little bit about Target. I'm guessing everybody here knows about Target, but just in case not, it's important that we talk about scale. We have 400,000 team members, 4,000 engineers, 1,900 stores. Um, one of them is just around the corner if you want to go check it out. And hopefully some things that I get value from, then maybe you could too. So I joined the application security team in 2016, and we had so much toil. Tons of spreadsheets being emailed around. If you had a pen test, you would get a PDF of it. Different kinds of findings came in the form of a spreadsheet that would be emailed to you on occasion. We had an entire security sub-team whose job was figuring out who owns all these findings and working with them slash hassling them to try to get those remediated. So it was really hard for the security team, but it was also super hard for the developers. They didn't know where, like when this would be, like they would get an alert from us that said, hey, you have to take action. They didn't quite know, like, am I secure? Am I not secure? Like, tell me some context of what you need me to do so I can do a better job overall. So we created this system in 2017 called Product Intelligence. I have spoken about this before, so I won't go into a great amount of detail, but I do want to set some context. So we created this system in 2017, and what it does is it pulls all the different spreadsheets and findings and security services that we want you to use into a centralized place. And then we created an algorithm that shows them a score. And the score is based off the same scale as a personal credit score. So it's a little bit familiar. You know that if you have a 678, like this fake product, you can maybe get a car loan, but not for a great interest rate. So it gives them some relative sense for what work they need to do in order to improve the system. And then we tell them exactly what they need to do to make their system more secure, sort of like the next best action. And so we outline all of that for the team. We don't ask them to trust us that that's the action. We show them all the data. Here's all the GitHub repos that are part of your application. Here's the current state of the things we want you to do with them. Here's um, the different applications that make up this product. If you have any security ninjas, if you've created any security events. So they can see all of that data and they really started to trust the system. And we give them a trend so they can see where they've been and um, get some context for whether or not they are better. It is hard for me to overstate how big of a deal this has been. It has absolutely changed the way that our security team works with our developers. But as we've said, toil is funny in that, you know, you kind of take your eyes off it for a few minutes and you've got a lot more toil. So your work is really never done. It's something that you'll have to be focusing on forever. So in the last 18 months or so, we started a new effort where we really wanted to think differently about how we were pushing work and asking development teams to take action. And we created this effort called MAP. It is an acronym. The M is meaningful data. Can we make it even easier for teams to take action? For example, one of the goals that we're working on is developers don't care what vulnerabilities they have in their systems. Just tell me what action I need to take, what patch I need to apply, or what steps I need to do. So we're pivoting away from vulnerabilities to actions. Asset differentiation, we have different risks for different systems. We want to make even more clear if you have a high risk system exactly what steps you need to take to uh, protect it. My favorite one of all of these is prevention. Remediation is so expensive. It's such a waste because if you can prevent people from doing the wrong thing in the first place, that's just time back for everyone. So we've started to introduce a lot more prevention in a thoughtful way to make sure that as soon as somebody makes a mistake, they don't have to go back and fix it. So um, I'll give you four examples. We have a number of things that fall under this map umbrella that we're really excited about, but my four favorite stories are what I'll share here. So the first one, we still have some spreadsheets. I think uh, if you're in the security field and don't use spreadsheets, I want to hear from you because that sounds great. 
Um, but we wanted to migrate all of the spreadsheets into the centralized system. We had a few edge cases where our teams were still using spreadsheets. And it became kind of expensive, about 1,000 hours a year managing some of these certain kinds of vulnerabilities, $75,000. So we've spent a lot of time this year integrating that into the centralized system. There was cost to that. It was 500 hours. But overall, we're saving now $38,000 by just investing in the upfront work. The second example is the one that hurt my heart the most when we did the math on it, um, because it's really easy. We asked teams, all of the application teams at Target, to onboard your GitHub repos to SAS and SCA. It was very easy. We had great documentation, but it's just the scale problem. All of these teams had to go onboard these things manually. And when we added it up, it was about 8,000 hours that we spent in the onboarding process across those 4,000 developers. That's $600,000 a year. So with the smallest investment that we have in the four examples, 100 hours, we just auto onboard. We wrote some scripts, auto onboarded, and now we're saving um, over half a million dollars on that as new repos come online. Speed bumps are a really good way to introduce prevention without getting in the way of the business. And so we've started to introduce a lot more speed bumps. For secrets in code, hard-coded secrets like passwords or different keys that you don't want to have, um, we saw quite a few instances of these. And it's a huge hassle for developers. As soon as they do it, we get an alert. They have to spend the next several hours rotating the secret, updating their code, et cetera. There's an online, or sorry, an open source utility called Sedated that we pulled into our GitHub repository. It's an acronym that I can't tell you what it stands for. We made some modifications to Sedated, so now it's a speed bump, and it says, hey, are you sure you want to commit that? Because it looks like you might have a secret here on this line. They go and look, and we are saving them time. The investment was a, you know, something, 300 hours, but now we're saving all of this time going forward where people were seeing a many fewer instances of secrets being accidentally committed into code. And the last one, vulnerable log4j. So probably like a bunch of you, we spent much of December 2021 making sure that we were no longer using vulnerable versions of log4j. But we continued through 2022 to see people accidentally use libraries they're familiar with and recommit uh, vulnerable log4j in their code. We would again, the security team gets an alert, same day they have to go in and fix that. That's just a waste of time. There's no good reason that anybody intended to commit with vulnerable log4j. 10,000 hours is what we estimate based on the quick remediation that people had to do for three quarters of a million dollars. And so um, this past year, we've made the biggest investment, which was 800 hours of my team's time doing engineering work. But now, that's blocked. You get an alert that's like, whoops, this has vulnerable log4j. Please don't commit. And here's how we can help you make sure that that's fixed. So saving almost $700,000 going beyond that. What's super interesting about what we're bringing forward to this is Again, this is not necessarily even necessarily an engineering problem, but it's an intentionality about where your time is being spent and the fact that that time costs something um, and where you could be better spending it. So what can you do after leaving this talk? Um, the first thing that we recommend is identify your toil. Spend some time with your AppSec team, spend some time with your engineering team, and ask yourselves those four questions we posed earlier, as well as finding work that fits into those six categories that we introduced earlier. Evaluate that baseline cost, and then what you can do is you can decide, okay, how much will this cost to fix potentially, and is this going to be worth fixing? Approach your higher ups, approach the people that you need to sponsor you in order to tackle this toil and get on that campaign trail and really become a toil champion. The, in the next six months, we recommend addressing a low-hanging fruit. Get a quick win, show your people that need to support you that this is actually worth their time, and you will start to detoil your, uh, uh, your organization in a way that really makes a difference. Also, a great thing to do is to get software engineers excited about your plans. The nice thing about reducing toil is not only does it increase your security posture, it also lets engineers and AppSec professionals work on engineering work that's actually interesting to them. So I'm sure that you'll have many software developers that once they see the outcome of your toil reduction strategy, will become really excited about your plans. In the next year, commit to taking on a big project like Jennifer did um, at Target and see how much money you can save your organization. And another thing we recommend doing is doing regular check-ins. Make addressing toil 
part of your development process, similar to doing a tech debt sprint or organizing it in whatever way your organization would be uh, most benefited by it. And the last thing we wanna say is please tell us if you are able to address toil, you can find Jennifer or I on LinkedIn and we would love to hear about your success stories. Maybe we'll even talk about it with some other people. So with that, thank you so much for coming and we're gonna open the floor for questions and answers. <laughs> I, there's mics in the back if you, I think they want that for recording purposes potentially. Yeah. There's, yeah, if you could use the mics if you have a question. And we'll just wait a couple of moments. Great. Beautiful. Hello. Hi, my name is Maria, also a NAPSEC um, person. Uh, my, I, I'm mostly curious about, you know, how we're going to be working with other people, our stakeholders, to reduce toil in some cases. Mm -hmm. How do we make sure that we're not like completely stepping on each other's to toes when we're reducing each other's toil. Mm. Are you talking about with the AppSec team and the developer team? Yeah, pretty much. I can tell you what we did and you can, um, so we have a pretty robust security champions program. We don't necessarily go tackle the toil quietly with a big ta-da at the end. I spent a ton of time hey, this is a problem, do you think it's a problem? Yes, and we're providing a lot of these updates to the security champions. In a couple of cases, they were so excited, they joined us. And we had efforts where the software developers worked with the AppSec team to maybe move things along faster. And so that was our best mechanism to make sure that people weren't working on the same things. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I don't thank know if you. you have a different answer. No, no, that's, yeah. that's, that's really good, actually. Hi, my name is Julie. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I run product security for GitLab, um, uh, for, for context. Um, I have a question. So when, when um, reducing toil, um, like it's, it's work that um, has to be prioritized in the context of like other work, right? You have you know, like critical projects of your own, and so you have to have um, some capacity to do it or sort of prioritize it above other things that the team might otherwise be doing. How, uh, how do you guys think about it in terms of like your mental model, like justifying it, like, hey, we're gonna have them do this instead of that for now, but it'll be worth it. Like, how do you, um, how do you sell the story of the ROI for that prioritization? I think a big thing you can do is when you're in your evaluate stage of the process is to highlight how much money it's costing your organization to tolerate this toil. And as we said earlier, um, the Google SRE team estimates that they try to get their uh, SRE engineers to spend about 33% of their time or less on toil. So that could also be a good benchmark for your organization. Maybe it's 50%, maybe it's 65%, whatever it is. And you can then be regularly checking in with your engineers, like when they're having their management one-on-ones or whatever it is when the AppSec team is uh, interfacing with the security champions, just asking them, hey, how's this toil going? Is this, is this lessening? Is it worsening? Um, and you'll find that actually your employees start to become more engaged and they start to put in better work, which then will compound, kind of make this virtuous cycle, um, which will help, of course, sell the, t the concept to the people that you need to sell it to. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, hi, David. Uh, looks like I got a few questions. So um, you have two teams, AppSec and, and developers. Uh, uh, concepts of champions that that's really great because that reduces the need for uh, AppSec uh, involvement right and with that um, things like training uh, you, you're just training on the SAS tools and and with that they learn you know things like boot camps they never work so they're learning on their own with code quality mm -hmm. right that, that's what you're focused on mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Um, one thing that I was running up against in my story is that the developers were not familiar with the existing resources that the SAS tool provided. Um, and so when I trained them on the dashboard, not only were they like, oh, okay, this is how, well, they, they saw the vulnerabilities that they needed to fix, but they also got that remediation guidelines from the SAS tool itself, and which improved our security posture because then they were educated on what to do next time. Uh, uh, great, great, guys. Uh, I, I, you know, seeing this and talking about low friction, providing heavy training is heavy friction. So, <laughs> uh, uh, 
And with that, their own training, uh, are you looking, uh, have you thought about embedding security as an aspect of quality? You, you know, some of the new tactics, uh, I guess it's been around for a while, mm -hmm. is, is uh, uh, Martin Fowler, I, I forget who the other guy is, focused on code quality. Mm. So, and, and with that, establishing guardrails, including security in a, as an aspect of quality. I think for us that's true. One of our, we have kind of some principles that we follow with the application security function. Mm -hmm. And one of the biggest ones is make the right way to do something, the secure way of doing it, the easiest way for that to be done. And with that will come some reduction in toil. Um, and so that's the way that we've approached it wherever possible. I like security education. I think it's really good to understand how things work. But even better is to make it really hard to do the wrong thing, and then you're not just relying on somebody's knowledge. They're just kind of working within the tools that they're used to. And, and hence, it lowers the need for a very, very large AppSec team because yeah. they're just there to help. I, I saw some of that that uh, that radar chart mm -hmm. involved in in very specific questions and and running say say uh, 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 um, some scans, things like that. Uh, okay. Good. Um, last question I have is, well, I guess a couple more, is you mentioned ticketing, okay? We're trying to get as far left as possible, and we're adding features into their work item build so that it's included as part of the build. Is, is that, uh, you know, that, that those are concepts that you thought about? Are you asking, like, have we thought about putting it in, like, a CI/CD pipeline or, like, breaking builds on criticals? I'm, I'm a little confused on your question. So, uh, say, like, we find a bug, okay? Yeah. It's out of cycle. We find a bug. We put it into a work management solution that is part of their software development lifecycle. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's not a separate ticketing system, it's part of their feature build, and that feature gets tied to that build when, when they uh, uh, follow, hopefully, good quality management practices and, and build out uh, requirements, specs, even a test plan attached, and it all matches, and then, you know, uh, 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 what is it, uh, um, CI, CD, pass, and, and they just automate. Uh, well, what you just pointed to actually, sir, is a great example of using automation to reduce that toil, right? right. So um, yes, that is, a, that is a great strategy. Sometimes, especially in startup world, you don't have time to do something that robust. Um, and you have to just do maybe one or two of those things to re eliminate or reduce the toil. Um, but yes, if you had a large enterprise with a good amount of staff, that would be a fantastic way to address it. Okay. And Last question is, sometimes your, well, your security tools can't catch everything, yeah. and therefore you need to manually define some security requirements. Yes. Are you uh, trying to get involved at, say, like PSI planning, something like that, to review the features mm -hmm. and say, yeah, that, that we need uh, further refinement, uh, we need to elaborate on the requirements for that one specific feature? I think for us it depends on the risk. Where it makes sense, we get involved really far up front. We have a lot of security requirements that are hopefully very clear to the teams who are building things based on the risk of the application. And then we use the tools to make sure that those requirements are being met. Well, uh, the tools may not catch things specifically on access because you, you'll have very specific access rules, so you'll have to review those manually. Yeah. So. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I suppose I, I should ask. It's mostly the access rules that you focus manual reviews or have them test on their own. Define and then have them test on their own. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank and then you. I think one more. I think we have one last question. Okay. <laughs> have you encountered any folks who like toil and then how do you address that? <laughs> kind of. I think there are some people who feel very comforted by work that they know. Exactly. Um, and great because toil is going to exist. And so if we can find, like I'm very passionate about finding the right job for the right person. And if somebody feels a lot of like, I keep using the word comfort, but like familiarity with that, so long as there's value overall in the task, absolutely, I think that works. Um, a lot of engineers are also looking for like innovation and so kind of finding the right place based on skills and interests. 
Your security champions are a great place to start with this. Um, they can really help champion this cause within your organization too. So they're the early adapters and they can help bridge that gap between um, helping people uh, address toil that maybe don't want to do it. So rely on them. Okay. All right, y'all, we are out of time. Thank you again so much for Thank coming. You. Find us outside if you want to talk more.